protect large numbers of children in the town from grooming, sexual assault or rape. The right decision would be to resign and take full responsibility for what happened. I just think it's what everyone would expect. Everybody has called for you to go. I was failed by some professionals, such as the police and social workers. I was failed by people that should have been protecting me. These abusers get a buzz of having control, having power over these girls. We'd have to have sexual contact with as many people as they told us to. Uh, you listen to your heart, you listen to yourself, and you'll know you can get through it. You'll survive it. I've been tormented and I'll probably carry on being tormented. Didn't know any different, really, because of where we lived, it was normal. In Rotherham, hundreds of young girls had their lives torn apart. Failed by the police, by social services, failed by men who abused them. Some were brought to justice, but the scourge of grooming continues. Nearly half of current child sexual exploitation cases being pursued by South Yorkshire police are rooted in Rotherham. There has been progress, though, with 21 convictions over the last three years. For those victims brave enough to speak out in court, the law protects them with lifetime anonymity. Some, though, have decided to go further. Best friends Lindsay and Natalie tonight speaking on camera for the first time. Lindsay was 15 when she was abused by Arshid, Ash Hussein. Arshid's brother, Banaras, Bono Hussein, raped Natalie when she was just 13. Both were given lengthy jail sentences. What happened that first time that you met him? He was just trying to get on top of me. He was trying to pull my trousers down um, on the settee in front of everybody. Um, but I like, pushed him away and I think it's because everyone would be there. I could get away. And the following day, next day, my friend took me to his house and um, left me with him in the bedroom. And that's when the first time he cost us raped me because I couldn't get out there. And he wouldn't let me out and he was putting fear into me. And I just couldn't get out of the room. I mean, it must have been absolutely terrifying. Yeah, it was. I went home and got, I remember getting straight in the bath and scrubbing myself. Mm. But you were sort of thinking that this was like a normal boyfriend-girlfriend situation. Yeah, because I'd never been in a relationship really before. I'd had been out with people and said, oh, this is my boyfriend, but that's it. I'd never had a relationship. What did your parents think? My parents didn't know at first, and when I got pregnant, I didn't tell them. I kept it a secret for like three months. It was only afterwards that they knew. And having to end the pregnancy, what kind of toll did that take on you? It was torture because I couldn't tell anybody were pregnant because they were older, like no, no adults. I think I told a couple of friends, but one minute I was wanting to keep it because I wanted, that, well, in my head I thought, oh, he's going to be with me and everything's going to be fine. Obviously, it wouldn't have been. And Natalie, what impact did he have on your life? My childhood was ruined from that point and the following years was... My life has been destroyed. There's another occasion I went to where we lived. There was like a woods there and I wouldn't do a sexual act on him and he pulled my ear back and started kicking me on the floor. Um, I phoned the police then and I, I was scared and I said to him what he'd done and they said, well, you've got to press charges, we can't do anything. I goes, oh, I'm scared, I'm scared, you don't know what they're like. But I gave him a name, nothing we're done. So how does that strike you now? Yeah, disgusting. I don't know 
what I've had to deal with or gone through and I was just a child <laughs> and there's all these people there that's supposed to be protecting you and they didn't. Do you think that things have changed in Rotherham or are you fearful that some of the awful abuse that you went through might still be going on? You just know that it's still happening. You see when you're driving down town centre roads, you see the, the men in the cars and the girls and stuff. You still see that yeah. now? But if you can see that, why can't the police see that? I don't know. What is it like every day, though, living mm. with what happened to you? Um, a torment, yeah. I have to relive it and have to deal with panic attacks and it's torment. I've been tormented and I probably carry on being tormented. It's, it's really bad. <laughs> it's hard to trust anybody mm. and get close to anyone. You have attachment problems with every... It's not just relationships, it's yeah. with everybody in your life. Yeah. Or it does get better. And the incredible thing is that, you know, you've been best friends from childhood. Mm. You went through hell together. Yeah. You stayed best friends. And then here you are, both of you, still the best of friends, talking mm. about this. We've just had to support each other through it, yeah. like court. But we've had it a lot easier because we, I've been able to speak to her and she fully understands, yeah. even if I can't explain myself right, yeah. she knows what I'm trying to say and how it feels and the same, yeah. vice versa. Yeah. How important is this relationship to you? Yeah, very important, yeah. <laughs> best friends. <laughs> You'll always be best friends. Yeah. yeah. Well, many survivors of sexual exploitation committed crimes while they were under the control of grooming gangs. One proposal for helping to minimise the long-term impact on them is to have their criminal records expunged. Some senior police officers are backing a change to the law to offer them pardons. And I'm joined now by Sammy Woodhouse, who was also abused in Rotherham and who is behind the campaign for a so-called Sammy's Law. And here in the studio, Vera Baird, the lead police and crime commissioner on victims. Sammy, we just heard that very powerful testimony from those two people, and many of that will be... Much of that will be familiar to you, I'm sure. But can you explain to us what sorts of crimes children who were being groomed and abused were then convicted of? Um, well, I think we need to look at people as individuals and, you know, we've all got different experiences and we was all for to do different things. Um, I myself had three things on my criminal record. So, for an example, I was caught half naked in bed with him. Uh, just a few days after my 15th birthday um, and because he'd given me a truncheon to save in, in my bag I was then arrested um, he wasn't he wasn't even questioned and still today because it's classed as um, a dangerous weapon that's still on my criminal record and and what you know people need to realize is um, what you know we've come forward we've testified in court we've proved that we were um, a victim of this crime but yet we're still being punished for it if I was to go for a job interview I would have to declare that I'd have to go into my abuse um, and it's for us as, as for victims and survivors we're constantly having to battle to be able to move forward and try and have um, you know any kind of life really and I guess rather than talk about all of that many survivors would rather just not apply for jobs not get themselves into situations where they'll have to confront that yeah, definitely. Um, you know, like I say, when you go to a job interview, you'd have to relive that abuse. Um, and, you know, for, for some people, it is so difficult to go through it. I mean, I've done it a lot now just because I'm a campaigner, but it's still very exhausting. It's draining. It's something, you know, I only do because I know it helps other people. Um, you know, to be able just to go to a job interview and, and want to say, well, actually, I want to get back into work. I want to provide for myself and move forward with your future. And to have to constantly just go over that all the time, it's, it's just not OK. Uh, Vera Baird, um, you've been a, a politician in Parliament as well as being a, a, a criminal um, QC. What, what are the obstacles to doing this? Um, it's obviously the right principle. Somebody's subordinated to another's will and they commit a crime when that's in the, in the, the situation. They're not doing it of their own free will. That's now recognised going forward. The modern slavery legislation, which is very new, of course, understands that principle. So do you think they wouldn't be convicted today? If uh, well, they, in that there situation? would be a defence if they'd been enslaved, not, not groomed, but if they'd been enslaved or they'd been trafficked, then there is a defence that they did it because of that. If they're under 18, they don't even have to show they were 
compelled, they have to show that another similar person, i.e. their age and gender, would have done the same, i.e. that it was a reasonable and only response. And then they won't be prosecuted. So what seems quite wrong is that that is going forward and uh, it is only about slavery and exploitation. This is about grooming, which is just as damaging, and we have to try and look back. But to do that, I think Sammy's hit the, the nail on the head, we probably have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, and it probably needs legislation. So it can't be a blanket pardon for everybody? No, how could it be? It would be about the levels of grooming. Even the Modern Slavery Act only pardons low-level crime because of being uh, suborned. It doesn't do stuff like kidnapping and murder. And obviously, different levels of coercion are relevant to different levels of crime. You would have to show in each case, I think, what had happened. But the oh, Lord Commission that... could work out a way of doing this. And I think it's urgent the government's asked them to do it because brave people like this who've come forward are being held back from having a good life now by the fact that when they were groomed, quite against their own will, they committed crimes. Sammy, one of the most striking things in that interview uh, with, with Cathy there was those women saying they still see the perpetrators. Yeah. Clear implication that it's still going on. Is that yeah, your belief? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it is still going on in Rotherham around the country. Some people think, oh, well, this only happens in Rotherham. And, of course, that's not true. It's, uh, it's a major problem um, for the country, not just street grooming. Um, online grooming now is absolutely huge. Um, when it was happening to me, we didn't really have things such as Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, all the, the internet thing now. So um, that's a huge problem. And we, I do think we've made um, a lot of improvements in Rosam, definitely. I mean, you know, the court cases um, speak for themselves. And, you know, especially people uh, like Lindsay and Natalie coming forward um, and testifying in those. And, you know, just by coming forward, they've, they've put those people in prison. Um, they've helped keep so many people safe. They've raised awareness by that. And the fact that they're, you know, now waving their anonymity to, to help raise more awareness, I think is great. And, yeah, we, we need people like us to, you know, to keep speaking out. Because, of course, it is still happening. We need to uh, try and, and do what we, we can to make it stop. Vera Baird, I mean, you would hope the police have different attitudes today. Yeah, do, I... Do, do, I you, do you also believe it's still going on to that degree? And that the police aren't noticing? I think that there are now um, accepted ways in which the police look when they get the slightest clue that such a thing is happening and pursue it. And it is people like this speaking out who've made it better nationwide. Well, not, not according just to the testimony we just heard, though, was it? I mean, they were saying they see these guys driving around. Well, I mean, there have just been a whole series, Operation Sanctuary, it was called, of convictions of exactly this kind in Newcastle. As soon as there was a clue it was going on, the police were in there putting a great deal of resource and effort into ensuring that they got convictions. They've had convictions and sentences of 300 and odd years altogether. Vera Baird, Sam. I was just going to a shopping centre with my friends on the weekend. I was 12 years old at this time. Uh, and I was approached by a group of young boys. Started talking to them, struck up a friendship, and they slowly just started to introduce older and older people to me. And that's how it first started. They were from good families, like they were, they were nice boys, they were well dressed, they were well spoken. They'd buy me a McDonald's, a Happy Meal, um, and then as they started to introduce older people, we'd go in the cars and we'd listen to music and we'd just park up and we'd have a chat and we'd laugh. Uh, they slowly started to introduce alcohol and soft drugs as part of my grooming. And was there one particular ringleader that you became involved in? Yeah, I became singled out in many ways by one of them. We'd become friends. I'd spend all my time with him. If something was wrong in my life, he would put it right. He was sort of a knight in shining armour. He was perfect. And he was the first one who actually started to sexually exploit me. We was just hanging around in the bus station and they started to touch me up. My main perpetrator and another member of the group and I initially, I felt uncomfortable because obviously I'd never had a boyfriend or anything like that. I was still a child. Next thing I knew it was actually on top of me raping me and I was being pinned down by other men. And that was when I, when, that was my first encounter of sexual assault. From then, I 
went into sexual exploitation really without even knowing it because in a way that was sort of like I'd been broken in um, and I used to have to sleep with whoever wanted to sleep with me and I had no one to run to or turn to you know my parents became aware of what was happening and they was banging on every door possible no one would help them it was seen as I was making a choice and actually I'd had all my choices removed from me you know I was a child and adult men who were dangerous and who were criminals were controlling me. So were your perpetrators ever brought to justice? No, uh, I had a really bad experience with the police. They treated me like I was a naughty child. I was the problem. And basically I just need to sort myself out and if I sort myself out, all these problems will just go away. Um, they treated me as though I was a liar uh, I'm, I've got my video interviews, what I did back then, and I was a child. I was 13 years old on one and I was 14 years old on the other and I was sat describing being sexually assaulted and sold on my video interviews and they were interrogating me more than they would if I would have been a criminal and actually committed a crime and I was an abused child and it's actually... it's. It's disgusting to watch. I'd saved all my clothes that I'd been sexually assaulted in. And you could quite clearly see I'd been sexually assaulted in these clothes. Um, I gave them them as evidence and they actually lost them. So there was no evidence. It was my word against theirs. Uh, and I wasn't what the police call a reliable witness. You know, I wouldn't do very well in court because I could be aggressive and I wasn't always helpful. Um, so basically there was no chance of a conviction. Are you still hopeful that you will get justice, that your perpetrators will be sentenced and jailed? Yeah, I am. And not just, I don't think so much for what they've done to me, but just for the simple reason I feel that these people shouldn't be at, out on the streets. They're a danger to the public. And while ever they're walking about, people aren't safe. My name's Sarah Wilson and I'm a survivor of the Rotherham Abuse Scandal of 1400. If we wasn't to go and meet these abusers, it's either my house got petrol bombed, my mum or sister was getting threatened to be raped. Extreme stuff would have happened if I didn't go out of that house. These abusers would circle round the children's home and wait for me to leave it to pick me up. If I went to a different city and I was on my own, I'd probably have to sleep with 20 men in one night. And that wouldn't be together, that'd be one after one. And if I didn't obey their rules, and then there's going to be painful consequences to pay. I don't blame the whole of Pakistani community for the simple fact I had a guardian angel, Hamid. He was my best friend, he was the father I never had, and he was British Pakistani. And he helped me get away from the abuse. I personally think he scared part of my abusers off, because if we'd park up in a garage, they, they wouldn't even dare look at me. I still live in Rotherham, why should I move out of my own town that I grew up in, that I was born in, because of these abusers? Shouldn't, be, shouldn't that be the abusers moving out of Rotherham? If it was up to me, I'd live next door to them and intimidate them every single day. She'd say, nah, I'm not a child, I'm a woman, and I have a voice of my own. I'm a survivor, and they cannot hurt me in any way, shape or form, and I never will, ever again. You could tell with my appearance. I went to five and a half stone in different coloured hair. I were a, a totally different person. So obviously there were warning signs there. I weren't going to school, I weren't going home, so there's no way that they couldn't have realised that something were wrong. Aweka got involved with me, but she was trying, obviously she was trying to tell people what were happening and nobody would listen. Um, there were various authorities what knew what were going off and decided to ignore it. I had um, a child protection officer, she ignored it. Um, someone from social services, um, 
ignored it. There were various meetings about me, um, which were saying if there was anybody found to be dead, it would be me. Um, have things changed, do you think, in Rotherham? No. No. There's no support, there's no anything in place to basically show people that they've got support. He carried on for nearly four years. We were begging police for help, council for help, social services, and nobody did anything at all. I went twice to get my daughter out in this flat, and both times I was arrested. Never charged or given a warning or anything like that. The second time I was arrested, they told me if I returned to the flat, they charged me with stalking. And then it just got worse and worse. She went missing for 10 weeks. Me and her mum got suspicions she was dead. Every day we was phoning police for four years and they did nothing apart from they were concerned that we were being bad parents which we've only ever been good loving parents to our children which is the reason why me and our mum were fighting and fighting every day to find her and fetch her back if we'd been left to the authorities and police she'd have been dead across the road they were one of these special constables. At the taxi rank, the drivers were handing out cigarettes to children, and I'm telling you now, they can't have been no older than 14 year old. Stood there laughing and joking with them all in groups. Across the road, the police, these special constables stood watching them. I went past, I went to them, are you gonna see what they're getting up to over there? You know what's happened before. They just turned their backs and walked off. So I'm telling you, it is still going on. Definitely still going on. There's no children safe now. And I've got my grandchildren coming up to an age where they could be at risk. I've got to do everything I can as a human being to try and protect these children. And that's what I'm gonna do till the day I die. Somebody eventually has got to be prosecuted. And like I say, while I've got breath in my body, I'm going to fight until somebody is prosecuted because they're criminal. Myself, my son, the man that raped me in Rotherham Council, and the fact that my rapist has been offered by Rotherham Council to apply for full custody and parental rights. An unusual case getting quite a bit of traction here in the UK. A victim of child sexual exploitation has uh, waived her anonymity and come forward demanding a change in legislation following revelations that a man who had raped her as a teenager, as a result of which she became pregnant and had a child, was approached by a local council to basically see if this man wanted to be part of the child's life. The man in question was put behind bars two years ago to serve a 35-year sentence for multiple sexual offenses against uh, nine girls in the area, including that woman, Sammy Woodhouse, who Rotherham Council uh, invited him to potentially seek visits with the child. The man did not uh, go for this offer and did not seek such an application. However, this still triggered a push for a change in legislation. Uh, this is what a uh, local MP had to say on the matter. Appalling example of the law being set up either to favour the perpetrator or to actively work against the rights of abuse survivors and the consideration they should be afforded. The Ministry of Justice is currently investigating whether this uh, took place due to an error or whether there's potentially a wider problem behind this. We have also heard from uh, the council who said that they were basically just following guidelines. So there's uh, lots of questions to be addressed in this area yet again with this story now coming to the forefront. We spoke to some people in Rotherham in the north of England where the grooming scandal continues to haunt their town.
to be in, in prison for the rest of his life. Absolutely disgusting and it's, it's so horrible. I think it is disgusting. There's no else I can say, just disgusting. It's disgusting. The police have been frightened to death to do anything in the past and they're still not doing it now. It's absolutely incredulous, um, the fact that they can, they think it's acceptable to approach a convicted rapist and ask him if he, if he wants access to a child. Anti-grooming campaigner Sarah Ahmed says the rights of the victims must come first. Interest of the child is paramount. The case is centering around the child visitation of the child in the best interest of the child. That child doesn't need to know who that person was who did that to his mum, father or not. What happened to this woman is awful, awful, awful. And women do survive rape because that's what they are. They are survivors of rape. We can't talk about it enough. We do need to lift the lid open on it and examine what happened. You have to look at the bigger picture. It is still happening. We do need prosecutions. We do need parents to speak up and say, yes, our daughter was a victim. In the English community, the English families, they will go and they will seek prosecution. And But within the Asian community where it does happen and it's still rife, the groomers are protected by their own community because they are chained by um, honour and um, stigma. So that's why their prosecutions aren't there. Lessons have been learned, but they are not being acted upon. investigation into one of the worst cases of child sex abuse in the UK is stalling due to a lack of qualified personnel. The abuse scandal centres around the sexual exploitation of 1,400 children over the course of three decades in the British town of Rotherham. It was revealed that 80% of these suspected perpetrators were of Pakistani origin. RT's Polly Boyko looks at why the investigation launched three years ago is failing to make progress. According to the senior officer investigating the scandal, 100 more police officers are needed to uncover the truth. So far, police have managed to interview 17% of a possible 1,500 victims due to a shortage in specially trained detectives. It's a really specialist area, engaging and interviewing vulnerable victims. A lot of our victims were children when they were abused, but they're now adults and have associated problems as a result of that abuse, including suicidal tendencies, mental health issues, drug and alcohol addiction. The Rotherham scandal led to a national outcry when the scale of the child abuse was first exposed back in 2012. Two years later, an independent inquiry found that for decades, through systemic failures in policing and social services, the sexual abuse of children went on right under the noses of the authorities. Gangs of men, the majority of whom were of Pakistani origin, preyed on mostly white girls aged from 11 to 15. Many of the victims thought they were in relationships with their abusers. When the crimes were uncovered, local authorities in Yorkshire were accused of failing to tackle the problem, partly through fear of being branded racist. On the part of the authorities, uh, in their cases, they were actually saying that these girls made a lifestyle choice. It's about the fact that the, the authorities didn't want to be branded racist. The, the ringleaders of the Rotherham uh, grooming gang uh, last year, I think, uh, yeah, the distant relatives of mine. But you know what? It doesn't change the responsibility that people like me have on uh, tackling this particular issue. So I've been campaigning against child sexual exploitation and uh, on-street gang grooming gangs uh, who are predominantly of a Pakistani origin uh, for over 10 years. The investigation into Rotherham abuse has cost £10 million so far. Four individuals have been convicted, 18 have been charged and 38 have been arrested. No one senior has been held to account. And with just 17% of the victims interviewed so far, all this may just be the tip of the iceberg. What we had is a group of girls that were coming to this park and being given a little bit of alcohol, having a good time, 
um, driven around in cars, um, sat in cars, music playing quite loud, um, given cigarettes and, and everything free, everything at no cost. Um, and then as grooming starts to escalate, what happens is they start to get threatened. Um, and I remember one girl saying to me is, he knew everything about me, Jane, and all I ever knew was his nickname. He knew my family, he knew where my mum worked, he knew what my dad did. So when he threatened me, he threatened me with things like he was going to go to my disabled grandma's house and have a shot, he was going to rape my mum. And I believed all that. I believed it because that's what he was doing to me. talking about some of the worst kind of violence and abuse that I think um, the world's maybe not ready to listen to, you know, but, but you're talking um, beatings, threats, um, broken instruments being used, torture, um, girls having petrol poured on them, you're talking um, tragic, tragic lives destroyed, really all those children destroyed. I was speaking to um, a member of the community, a Pakistani uh, man who was also a taxi driver a few weeks ago. And one of the things that he said to me is, well, two things that he, he said and, and stuck with me really is, as a taxi driver, if he'd have known about this, he would have helped and he would have been the eyes and ears and he would have shared information. But as a Pakistani man, his education has never, ever covered anything like this. I'm not in a position to give a full answer because I'm not working with children at the moment. I'm trying to support those children I worked with years ago that are now young adults. However, they are telling me that they are aware that it's still happening and they see it still happening and they've seen their abusers driving around with young people in their cars. That was just plain mean, wasn't it? Sorry to interrupt the beauty pageant with the pig ugly son of a bitch you're seeing reconstructed before your eyes. This is, oh, there's another pig ugly son of a bitch to keep him company. These are Aftab Hussein and Abid Sadiq. You might remember them from the last video. Latest in the seeming never ending procession of Pakistani Muslims forming part of another Rotherham grooming gang. All roads lead to Rotherham who, Muslim men who thought they'd got away with raping very young girls, and somewhat improbably, as it turned out, were wrong. I mean, they were obviously right in thinking they'd get away with it, it had been going on 20-odd years, but as we know, there came a point when the authorities' complicity in these Pakistani gang rapes just couldn't be kept under wraps any longer. Five more members of grooming gangs that sexually abused girls in Rotherham have been jailed by a judge who attacked the indifference of authorities who failed to protect the victims. And they go on to list the various predictable offences. The group abused seven victims who were all under 16 at the time after plying them with alcohol and drugs between 1998 and 2002. 
Judge Michael Slater said he was quite satisfied that relevant authorities were well aware of the way vulnerable teenagers were being targeted at the time. He told the court that officials were at best totally ineffectual and, at worst, wholly indifferent. That's the judge saying that on the basis of the evidence he heard in the court, he considers the authorities, the council, the police and the like, indifferent to what was going on. The defendants are the latest group of offenders jailed as part of Operation Stonewood, which continues to investigate the sexual exploitation of girls in Rotherham between 1997 and 2013. A total of 20 men have so far been convicted, and the National Crime Agency vowed to continue the investigation, which has so far identified 190 suspects and engaged with 313 alleged victims out of an estimated 1,500. And, as a convenient segue, Sarah Champion, the Labour MP for Rotherham, paid tribute to the survivors and witnesses that came forward to secure the convictions, etc., etc., Madame Champion wrote two years ago in The Sun about the matter of Pakistani Muslims. Sarah Champion, British Pakistani men are raping and exploiting white girls and it's time we faced up to it. Britain has a problem with British Pakistani men raping and exploiting white girls. There, I said it. Does that make me a racist or am I just prepared to call out this horrifying problem for what it is? For too long we have ignored the race of these abusers and worse, try to cover it up. No more. These people are predators and the common denominator is their ethnic heritage. We have to have grown-up conversations, however unpalatable, or in six months' time we will be having the same scenario all over again. The irony of all this is that by not dealing with the ethnicity of the abusers as a fact, political correctness has actually made the situation about race. I became the MP for Rotherham in November 2012 and within a month I heard the abbreviation CSE, Child Sexual Exploitation, for the first time. It was shocking. Mainly white pubescent girls were being sexually groomed and exploited by gangs of mainly British Pakistani men. I had to do something. I would not be another person who turned a blind eye to these crimes. Then she describes a bit of what she did. And then, more than 90% of abused children know their abuser. It is usually someone from within the extended family, and the vast majority of convictions are against white men acting alone. However, as the latest case in Newcastle proves, we must accept that for gang-related child sexual exploitation, the convictions have largely been against British Pakistani men. The government must act now to understand why this is. And following that, The Guardian interviewed a bunch of offended Muslims in Rotherham with the predictable responses. Just six days later, they got this together just six days after Sarah Champion's article. That's how fast The Guardian moved. This is a Muslim councillor, Taiba Yassin. Yassin, exasperated with the former Shadow Equalities Minister, said, People are asking where this has come from. Has she always had these views? It was unwise, in the most extreme sense, to betray an entire ethnic group, and I still have no idea why she said it. Really, wow, no idea? None? Which views is she talking about? She made recommendations. Sarah Champion made recommendations based on verified facts, and this Muslim counsellor comes out with a complete straw man about her betraying everyone and playing all injured innocents. Then another one. Standing outside the town's game store, a British Pakistani student, Tavab Sadiq, 20, said, It's an absurd comment to make. She's basically calling me a rapist that I was born a rapist. Again, not what she said. However, as the latest case in Newcastle proves, we must accept that for gang-related child sexual exploitation, the convictions have largely been against British Pakistani men which we also had corroborated in the Quilliam report, 84% of these rape gangs are Muslim Pakistanis. And a side note, if anyone's wondering, Pakistani and Muslim are basically interchangeable. Pakistan is officially the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, and the population is almost fully Islamic. So, Pakistani or Muslim, it comes to the same thing. Carrying on. Zlacha Ahmed, chief executive of Apnahak, a Rotherham group tackling violence against women and girls, said the MP had offended her three sons. My sons are British university educated, and they have read that piece, and said that Sarah is saying that anybody who is of Pakistani male heritage is a rapist. Same obvious bullshit straw man. 
But as a result of the fake outrage and those straw man accusations, the MP was sacked from her shadow cabinet job and she basically wrote a retraction, basically distancing herself from her own comments, which were factually based and where she quoted the sources of those facts. Factually based with sources quoted and she distanced herself from it because the Pakistani Muslim community postured outrage. So, fast forwarding back to the top. And two weeks ago, is this really surprising? Judge Michael Slater said he was quite satisfied that relevant authorities were well aware of the way vulnerable teenagers were being targeted at the time. He told the court that officials were at best totally ineffectual and at worst wholly indifferent. So considering that jobs were lost and the sheer ferocity of the backlash against factually based comments and recommendations was such that retractions had to be made, retractions of factually based commentary, it's not really all that surprising that even possibly well-intentioned officials at least seemed to be totally ineffectual and even wholly indifferent, mindful as they obviously would have been about just those consequences. I mean, if you thought your job was at risk, you might well put on a front of indifference to the facts as you knew them to be and act like nothing was happening. And not to forget, of course, that the Labour government of the time ordered the police to stay quiet, according to Nasir Afsal, the prosecutor who dropped that bombshell on BBC Radio a while back. And so they got away with it. Not now, fully quarter of a century later, Quarter of a century later, this bit has been put right. Quarter of a century of denied justice because the hurt feelings of that were prioritised as the overriding considerations. The hurt feelings of that animal and animals like it were considered of primary importance in the United Islamic Kingdom. And there is the United Islamic Kingdom. Burkas and niqabs as far as you can see. Everyone a burqa or a niqab in the centre of the capital city of the UIK. Yeah, good, isn't it? Isn't it good? And as we know, it's still going on because Muslim hurty feelings, hurty worthy feelings, are the overriding priority for the government, not the prosecution of just about any level of criminality, as long as the perpetrators are from the peaceful people. It's your government. So, to wrap up, shall we disinfect the room with some hate music? Haram, forbidden in Islam, guaranteed to disinfect the surroundings of gang rapist. Shall we hurty-wurty a few feely-wheelings and damn the consequences? Three of the report says that in 2008, an 11-year-old girl came to the attention of the police after she disclosed that she and another child had been sexually abused by a group of adult males. Just a few weeks later, she was found in a derelict house with another child and a number of adult males. Yet she, she, she was arrested, 11 years of age, she was arrested for being drunk and disorderly, and none of the males were arrested. Have you, has your force identified the police officers involved in that and found out what went on? Um, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Don't know. All right. In paragraph 5.2, what? Will you find out? We will. I apologise. And come yes. and tell us next week. We I will have, have a don't know on these issues. Correct. Right. I, I will have an answer okay. to that question next week. Paragraph 5.21 shows how a police officer dismissed the case of a 12 year old girl who had been having sex with up to five Asian males because he said she had been, quote, 100% consen consensual in every incident. 12 years of age? I think that's just, I think that's unbelievable, to be honest. Have you, has, have you identified who that officer was and found out what happened there? Can I, well, can I just make one thing clear? That um, 
I've, I've said today that we must have an independent investigation team to come back at this. I have also personally spoken I, to the director what, of investigation. If a report, the sorry, Mr. Austin, could the Chief Constable just finish? Please finish. I, I've also personally spoken to the director of investigations at the IPCC, and um, uh, to, in order to involve them in this as well. Well, if a report, if people I was responsible for managing, if a report landed on my desk, well over a week ago now saying that people I was responsible for had behaved like that, I'd want to know pretty quickly what on earth had happened. In paragraph 5.9, it says that fathers had tracked down their daughters and tried to remove them from houses where they were being abused, only to find themselves arrested when police were called to the scene. Do you know what happened in that case? Chair, I don't seek to defend any of this, and that I've asked for an. Imp uh, I'm in the process of setting up an imp independent investigation because the number of staff in uh, at Rotherham over such a period of time know, means that it can't have credibility unless we have some independence know, to the investigative process. I know, but I don't think it's too much to expect that in cases like that, which have been the subject of huge publicity over the last few weeks that you know, the force could have made, could have identified what happened. The truth, I mean, this report sets out the industrial scale abuse of young girls in, in horrendous detail, and it shows that they were completely failed by the police in Rotherham. And I'd have thought that finding out what happened and finding out who's responsible for that failure ought to be a pretty big priority. It is a big priority, and I am public on saying that it is a big priority and have, have taken steps to start putting the wheels in motion to make it happen. Why, why is it another police force that's going to be doing this investigation and not the IPCC? Um, well, because uh, there are, I think, two aspects that we need to look at here. Uh, one is straight criminality. Are we, do we have people still out in the community who should have been um, uh, improperly investigated years ago and weren't? And that's more of a straight criminality issue. Yeah. I think the second issue which is more in the territory of the IPCC, and this was a conversation I had this, only this morning with the Director of Investigations, is more about um, senior people who, what did they know, what did they do, and, and uh, were there failings there. Now, certainly around um, the IPCC, that's uh, more in their territory where police officers are concerned. I think, you know, as far as the Council are concerned, a criminal investigation would have to prove um, misfeasance, malfeasance, something like that. But it's not just senior people, is it? I mean, someone, one of your officers decided that a 12-year-old girl was having sex with up to five adults and was 100% consenting in every incident. Should somebody like that be working for the police? So, I mean, no. somebody's capable no. of making a decision like that. No, it's a, it's a dreadful decision. No. And, and, and I've set my position out to find out about it. I, I think that there's a feeling that just giving it to another police force is not necessarily the answer, given what we've just heard, your testimony, in respect to the other matter. Uh, and perhaps the importance of an independent report, it should be conducted independently by the IPCC, would recognise the fact that there's, if there's criminality, you'll need to have police officers involved. But that can be taken on by the IPCC as well. And uh, I think that's what Mr Austin is getting at. The fact that uh, some of these cases, including the case that he's just mentioned, I think is in our last report, and we will certainly want to know next week when you come in to give uh, evidence on this uh, again, that those officers, as Mr Austin has said, have been properly disciplined for what they've done. Uh, Dr Huppert, Nicola Blackwood and Michael Ellis, we have to close. We have other witnesses and we will return to this again. Thank there are many questions which we will, we will look at next week and I think I would agree with the, the role for the IPCC. This has to be sorted out properly and I hope you will, you will take that further. Can I ask one very brief question? What would you say is the level of confidence that the community in Rotherham currently have in the police force? I suppose it's difficult to say, but uh, I suppose what I would absolutely have to concede in the circumstances is that um, that confidence is probably less than it was uh, a week or two ago before the publication of the report. Absolutely. There's no doubt that a report like this is going to impact on community confidence. That's a matter of massive regret, but the point for somebody like me is that we have to take things forward here and try and put things right. So aside from the independent investigation and the IPCC involvement, what else will you do to try to rebuild that relationship? Uh, there are already, um, we, 
I mean, as you will be aware, there are 15 recommendations in the report. We're looking at each of those, comparing where we are with our current practice against what's going on uh, and the recommendations, and starting to make assessments about whether we, ourselves, or partners who we work closely with need to do more, whether we need to invest more, whether we need to change practices in order to address the serious issues which have been raised in the report. And would you be able to give us that response in time for next week? I will do my very best, sir. We will want the response by next week, because the Parliament is going into recess. I'm not saying the whole world needs to stop because we're going into recess, but because this is in the public domain and you have known about these circumstances for a number of years, we would like all the answers by next Tuesday. And Michael Ellis and then, sorry, and Nicola Blackwood and then Michael Ellis, my apologies. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I think that sort of credit is due for the 104 convictions, which you mentioned earlier. That's a significant improvement on the last time that you appeared when I think that you'd only had the five convictions. Very low number, yes. Um, but I, I just wanted to follow up on some of the points made by Mr Austin of um, the two fathers who were arrested, the victims um, who were arrested for petty offences, um, but also to go back through the history of some of the operations for child sexual exploitation which have occurred in South Yorkshire. Operation Central, which resulted in the five arrests. Operation Czar in 2009, abduction notices but no convictions. Operation Chard, again, um, abduction orders um, but um, 11 arrests and no convictions. Um, and then the following operations. And I'm just wondering what efforts there have been to go back to those victims, identify them, um, and try and make sure that um, you are making amends as much as possible and giving them the, the support that they need, but also offering them a route through investigation and the criminal justice process if they are willing to do so. Because if there has been any call that has been the loudest throughout the sort of national outcry of this, it has been for prosecutions and justice. Um, and if you are managing to get convictions at this stage, I think that going back to those victims and offering them the opportunity would be something I would hope that you would be doing. And can I uh, reassure you that uh, a year ago we set up um, a historical yep. child sexual exploitation team which is going back through all of these issues uh, that relate to Rotherham. And so uh, the particular cases that you refer to fall within the remit of that team. So there are clearly many more, but uh, the point I want to reassure you about is that part of their remit is to go back and identify where we may have failed victims and then look at where we can go with the investigative process. Thank you, Mrs Blackwood. And finally, Michael Ellis. Thank you, Mr Chairman. <coughs> Chief Constable, have you discussed Professor Jay's report uh, with your predecessor, uh, Med Hughes, who was Chief Constable from 2004 to 2011, and therefore was, uh, was Chief Constable during a large part of the operative period? Have you discussed it with him? No. Uh, don't you think uh, it would be a good idea for you to have made contact with him to at least see what he has to say about these matters? You, have you as you pointed out, were not Chief Constable at the time. Um, you don't think it's a good idea to make contact and find out some answers? Uh, so we may do that. Uh, however, it may be that um, there is the requirement that he's spoken to in another way by, by an investigation, and that also has to be brought well, how, how much blame should he shoulder? Because you, you don't uh, obviously want to accept uh, the shoulder of blame yourself, but how much blame do you think as Chief Constable during a large part of the operative period, and as someone who was, I believe, Deputy Chief Constable and Assistant Chief Constable in South Yorkshire before that, uh, how much blame should he shoulder? Um, I think it's a difficult one because this might get investigated. I think it would rather depend on what, what, what was known at the time, which I think is the issue, isn't it? Well, yes, but his priority was publicly uh, known as speeding. He was obsessed with a war on the motorist while um, these horrific crimes were going on in Rotherham. So don't you think, uh, prima facie, there is some responsibility for the ACPO rank police officers who were responsible in South Yorkshire during this operative period? Uh, clearly, there is responsibility at a senior level. It's impossible for me to say at this stage who knew what. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that we will be calling Meredith Hughes as well next week when we look at Rotherham again. I think, thank you very much for that, Mr Ellis. That's, a, that's very sensible. Um, Chief Constable, 
This committee has been shocked by events in Rotherham for the last two years. That's why I produced a report with 130 recommendations. Whereas in the Cliff Richard case, you could say, well, it's not me, it's the BBC or it's U Tree. The responsibility does rest with South Yorkshire Police. I know we've had different chief constables, and you may not necessarily have been there for the last 10 years, but this is the police force, so it, it, it reflects on the credibility of the police force. And we are shocked by this, and we do hold South Yorkshire Police responsible for the failures that have occurred. Many lives lost as a result of a decision not to take action. I'm sure you saw the Panorama programme yesterday. Yes. I will be writing to the Home Secretary to ask for that research that was conducted. It seems that all this has been around. That's why I wonder whether another report is necessary. I know it's important to get those responsible, and we should get them responsible, those to be held to account. But at the end of the day, what the people of Rotherham need is action. People being prosecuted, convicted. That's what they want to see happen. And if you've had 12 new cases since last Wednesday, it's a real worry to this committee, because there must be many more who have not come forward to give evidence. And, Chair, if I, if I might say so, um, it's my responsibility to move this on and get things right. I understand there are diffi difficult times around at the moment. Uh, we do have to restore public confidence. We have achieved prosecutions. We will achieve more. We've got some very significant investigations in, in the offing. Um, but it is my duty to take things forward. And irrespective of who's been Chief Constable in the past, I'm here now and it's my job to take it on from here. So you're, committed, you're not considering leaving your post and leaving it to somebody else to deal with, given the history of South Yorkshire, given what's happened in recent weeks and the report by Professor Jay, you want to stay and, and complete the job, is that right? Absolutely, and in fairness, uh, um, Alexis Jay does point out that things have been much improved recently, and yes. I think we can continue to improve on that. We will hear from her next week. Chief Constable, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Order, could we call Lord Tony Hall, the Director General of the BBC, James Harding, the Director of News, and Jonathan Munro, the Head of News Gathering? We're privileged to be joined this morning by Jane Senior MBE. She is the original... Rotherham whistleblower and she joins us this morning to help try to find ways of us talking about this topic. Jane, thank you for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome, Katie. Good morning. Good morning. So, Jane, I guess the big question that people will want to know, that I want to know is, what were you doing leading up to the point that you decided, enough, you have to blow the whistle? What was your job? What, was you, what were you doing? What was your daily kind of workload like? Um, I was managing the project in Rotherham, the Risky Business Project, that worked with um, a phenomenal number of young people that were involved in uh, child sexual exploitation. You know, that daily were talking to us as a staff team about some of the most harrowing um, stories of trafficking, of rape, of abuse, um, and in some cases, you know, what I would describe as torture. And nobody was listening, nothing was happening, we were sharing that information. Um, and, you know, sadly, um, we we were not getting um, listened to, we were not being believed, and um, our numbers were growing. And one of the things that we found that were quite significant is um, the ages of some of the young people were also getting lower, you know. So we we started in 1999 with the average age of being about 14, 15. And by 2011, we were seeing the 11, 12-year-olds starting to come through as referrals. And Jane, just take us to the point where you decided that's it, I've got to blow the whistle on this. And I, I appreciate, I think you're not a big fan of the term whistleblower, but at what, at what point did you decide that's it, enough? Was it a day? Was it a moment? Was it one more story? Was it, was it, what was that thing that tipped you over the edge? It was a build-up of lots of different things, but I think if I could pinpoint it to one thing is when I was asked to put together and collate quite quite a lengthy report on what was happening in that particular year, 2011. Um, and it included lots of information. Um, things that I thought were really good intelligence that the staff team did. It, it, it named um, suspected perpetrators. It identified details. Um, and we handed that in to um, relevant, you know, uh, organisations, believing that at long last, you know, some, something would possibly be done. Um, and it was, you know, they, they closed the business down. 
I think, Jane, are you, and, yeah. Uh, and so you handed that report in and something was done? Yes, yeah, it closed it down, yes. Yeah. They closed you down completely. And when you say closed down, what did they close down? They closed this business down, basically. Um, it, it happened very quickly. We were called in on the Friday. We were told that the business was no more. Uh, and by the Monday, we were put into the social care model um, and told that the project um, was going to be a, a brand new project and was going to be managed by um, the social care services. And what did that mean in terms of closing your department down? For me personally, um, it was probably one of the most difficult moments. Um, and for me, I just realised that I could not continue um, doing what I was doing um, and that we were now in a position where cases had to go through thresholds. Um, and, you know, it, it was just... it was the point I knew I had to walk away mm. and I had to leave and Jane when we think about now um, we you know some people have watched the TV drama some people I've seen articles discussing it almost as if it's over almost as if oh when we look back we should have done more what would you say about the situation today in the UK well one of the things I always say and I say it about Rotherham to start with is we've not had two damning reports and it's made it go away you know and um, Child sexual exploitation is happening everywhere. Rotherham's not unique. We know it happens across the UK. We've seen that with all the court cases, people coming forward. And what we're seeing now as well is a lot more victims of child sexual exploitation having the courage to come forward, report it to the police, ask for support, ask for help. And Jane, would you say the numbers, in terms of the numbers of cases, do you think the numbers are going up? Are you getting more reports? Is that because people are reporting more? Or do you think grooming gangs are more prevalent than ever before? I don't um, work within the child sexual exploitation of children arena now. What I do do um, is I manage a charity, and part of that charity is we do a lot of work with um, the adult survivors and their family members. So we have a lot of those children that I work with at Risky Business and other staff did that have come back to us as young adults in the 20s, 30s, and for a few of them in the 40s um, that are wanting some support, practical support, emotional support. And can I ask you a question? So Philip here on, uh, on Twitter is saying, my understanding is that these gangs have been broken up. Uh, that fills me with fear reading that. Uh, what would you say, Jane, to people that say, my understanding, and rightfully they've been given that understanding that these gangs no longer exist, that these gangs have been broken up? What would you say, Jane? I think, yeah, no, I think they still exist, but I think, you know, what, what we have got now is maybe a little bit more, and, and we're getting better at actually picking up some of them early indicators and actually, you know, working together as agencies to pinpoint and get in there a little bit earlier. But but no, and I will keep going back to saying it's not gone away, you know, and, and what we need to start identifying as well is, is the amount of families that are affected by this, the support that parents need. You know, we need a blank piece of paper sometimes and think about listening to those that are being affected by this, telling us what needs to happen to make things better. With regards to the report that was released today by Rotherham Borough Council, mm. it has highlighted an appalling failure of the system to protect vulnerable children. It suggests over 1,400 children were subjected to some of the most horrific abuse imaginable. We have only ever seen five men convicted for this type of crime from Rotherham. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I think the uh, scale of the report is sim simply staggering and some of the details are extremely hard to digest. 1,400 uh, children over a period of, of 16 years and you've only got five con convictions. Um, there's been mega failings throughout the whole system 
it's just beggar's belief, it's staggering. And if you if you take this 1400, and because this is just in one borough, if you just multiply by another 100 boroughs, you would see the extent of the problem that we are in, engrossed, engrossed in in the UK. I mean, reports from, from government itself are saying that up to 23,000 plus children are actually uh, you know, being groomed or sexually abused right now are in care. It's 23,000 children. So from your experience, from the Seek Awareness Society, you don't think this is a localised Rotherham issue, this is a nationwide issue? This is a nationwide issue, it's happening north, south and if you just look at some of the figures that we've had from Newcastle, groups, Operation Sanctuary, groups of over 100 people grooming young girls for so many years in, in uh, up in the north Bradford you look at you know they're finding groups of hundreds of people in a group grooming young girls in the south uh, the Met recently put a report out that in the last six months it has had 500 complaints from young people only in the last six months what do you think happened in the last 30 years so it's happening across uh, the country So Monting is clearly a system failure. It's allowing children to be abused, trafficked, sold like meat in supposedly one of the world's most advanced countries, not just in Rotherham, but across the UK. This is truly bewildering. How can the system have got it so wrong? Has the system made any changes to improve? Is there any changes that the SAS are trying to bring forward? I think we're always um, pushing forward for, for law change. It needs a complete look at this from outside the box. Whatever they've put in so far hasn't worked. Um, you know, from so many cases going back from the Derby case, the Rochdale case, the Manchester case, certain things they've put in haven't really worked. What they really need, the, the main problem that we've got here, and this is what keeps coming back to us, is that when a third party complains to the police it's not taken seriously it's recorded as a crime but it's not taken seriously until the victim comes forward of course we see victims may not come forward this is not typical of a crime for example a burglary where a victim is willing to come forward more or less straight away right, yeah. you're talking about a victim of grooming who's been manipulated who may not know she's actually a victim in that period of abuse. Well, there's two sorts of victims there, where you've got one victim who, who would probably be uh, terrorised uh, in the manner that we are, we will kill you, we will burn your house down, or we will lift your family members, scare the living daylights out of that young child who is only probably 12, 13, 14 at that, at that age. And then the other, the, other, the other thing is where the victim won't come forward is when you're in this uh, love fraud, when you're in this grooming process, the victim itself thinks that it's in love with the perpetrator. And when you're in love with somebody, you're not going to go to the police and complain about that person. So there's two things that uh, really um, keep coming forward when we're dealing with, it, with, with a lot of these cases. So you've got a child unwilling to come forward for, for the reasons you've explained, either engrossed in a relationship or the victim of blackmail, threats, intimidation. Yeah. Now, I mean, even this, just, just stopping you for a second, even this report itself says that victims were doused in petrol. They were going to be set, on, set, set alight horrific. or burnt. It's horrific. Now, if it's happening there, it's got to be happening around the country. So it's clearly now the system isn't geared up towards helping that victim until that victim makes a statement, which is not likely under these circumstances. Well, if you look at all the cases, how many victims have actually come and, and gone to a police station and says, I have been groomed? A person who has been brainwashed or thought, thought reform never knows its thought has been reformed until it's actually got caught into the into the the cobweb so it's not going to complain so if you look at all the major cases 
that have come to light. It is always a charity or somebody behind pushing it, talking to the child, giving the child the confidence and the support network so it then can um, go to the police. So Mon Singh, clearly the law is not working. The, the changes that the Sikh Awareness Society are, pro are proposing, could you explain some of them? Well, I think the main one, uh, uh, one or two comes to mind that we're really pushing for, and the main ones are that uh, when a third party complains to a the, parent, a, a, parent uh, a carer, uh, a distant relative, a friend, when they complain to the police that something is happening wrong with, with that child, then that warrants a, a full investigation in the same manner, in the same manner as if somebody reports an act of terrorism. It's not the terrorist that's going to come and tell you that I'm committing terror, but a third person reports an act of terrorism where the police then or the authorities then go in full blast. I think this should be on that that level whereas when a third party complains it should be a thorough investigation when we're talking about investigation we're talking about surveillance and we're talking about the whole kit and caboodle we're talking about whatever they can do or whatever they can throw at it because it'll the victim might never come forward and the perpetrator is going to get away with it whereas when the third party will uh, complain at least you've got a head start and you can you can maybe catch the perpetrators in the act of committing the crimes so within the laws at the moment the laws that you you, you state are inadequate is there anything the police can do right now to protect these victims I think we, the police, the social services, government, MPs, councillors, whoever's in power, needs to actually be brave, needs to put the fear factor out, throw political correctness where it belongs, in the garbage bin, and then and then only can we help, uh, we, we can move forward to help young victims. Hmm. Right, Singh, when we're talking about these predators, these vile men, broadly speaking, they fall into two categories. One, a standalone paedophile. Two, a grooming gang, street grooming, as it's been now known. Hmm. Could you explain the, uh, quickly explain the difference between the two? Well, when it's one-on-one, -on -one, um, the perpetrator is grooming a person, it's for its self gratification and for himself and it's not going to share it's very secret uh, when we've come across cases like that um, you know it, it, the child or whoever's being groomed has not been shared by anybody it's just for that one-on-one -on -one. when you're talking about these uh, grooming gangs and and the terminology really is grooming groups because these groups are known to each another some of them are relatives. You look at the high profile cases where brothers have been involved, uh, sets of brothers, uncles, and you know, the, the whole family come in here to, to groom people and to use them, abuse them. Now, uh, groups are using these people for their own set, uh, sexual gratification, but they're also then selling them off for, uh, for, for money, for favors, for, for certain things. So the person is not just going to be used by one or two people. It can be used by one or two people in that city, in that group, in different cities. It's been trafficked around the country. Looking at some of the convictions um, within this field of street grooming, grooming groups as you call them, yeah. there's been a, a massive cross-section across age groups and across towns and cities. So these are very well-networked organisations. Um, operating within various age groups how does this come about well it's organized crime it is organized crime that that's all i can say on this it's uh, so they have the resources to, to for the abuse to be elevated on a much higher level than a standalone pedophile of course there is if, if i i believe that if the police really did a thorough job then they will see the connections between these grooming gangs across the country would they be involved in any other crimes yeah, I think it relates from, from drugs, 
um, you, you've got prostitution, you've got trafficking of children. You know, I'm alarmed that the UK has become the capital of this kind of crime. Why do you think that, that is? What, what, what's the lure here? Is it the money? Is it the gratification? For the, the groomers, it would be, you know, the, both really. You're, you're getting your kicks out and you're also making money out of this and you could be making thousands out of this. We've come across children, a young girl uh, about three years ago who was groomed over a period of three, four months and when we were talking to her in her own safety, she was saying that some nights she could earn up to a thousand pounds. Now just imagine how many people she would have had to bed to earn a thousand pounds. So when we're talking about 1400 children in one town being abused, pimped, and the sums that you're talking, yeah. this is surely a very lucrative business for, for, for these groomers. It is, it's also a lucrative business, it's also a safe business. Because conviction rates are so low, conviction rates are so low, and the and the victim has to complain, and the groomers know that until the victim is uh, is not complaining, the groomers are safe. Okay. Lastly, there will be a lot of worried parents listening to this. What advice could you give them, Monsing? Well, you know. The only advice that I would give them is to watch the telltales of your, your children, be fully aware of your, your children. And that means from a very young age, you must be attending their school, their, their, you know, their report sessions and, and who their friends and who they're hanging out with and everything like that. So you know your child inside out. So when your child is behaving slightly oddly, you will be able to pick the signs up. That's if you're spending time with your children and we need to spend time with, with our children. So just imagine if a child is a very happy-go-lucky child and suddenly then becomes withdrawn. You know that you've got some sort of problem with that child. Uh, you need to look at it. Just imagine if a child is normally very family orientated, now is sitting up, up, up in his room. Um, it, it's, it's a problem. A uh, happy-go-lucky child now suddenly just cries or a, or a child who's very confident becomes unconfident or a school, school grades are dropping, her attendance in school is dropping. We need, the parents need to look at all these tell signs. And you know what, if they go onto the Seek Awareness webpage, the warning signs, the 12 warning signs that we normally give will be on the webpage. Thank you, Mohan Singh. Thanks for your time. No problem. Why did you come? Why did you give it?